So thanks, Don. Uh, and I want to echo Dan's thanks to the organizers for putting together the agenda. And for, personally, my most valuable experience from coming to meetings like this is meeting all of you. So if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, um, please feel free to come up and introduce yourself. I'd love to continue the conversation one-on-one. -on -one. So Acclaim is a startup uh, badge organization. We were funded by Pearson beginning in 2013. Uh, we re released our first version of our platform concurrent with the first release of the Open Badge specification in March of 2014. So we've been at this now for about two and a half years. Um, these are some of the groups that we're working with. Our focus from the very beginning has been not to try and invent new types of learning and represent that with a badge, but rather to document the existing learning outcomes whether that's a, a course outcome or a competency or a professional certification or a corporate training event or a high school equivalency degree and use the open badge specification as the data format. So basically the strategy has been pump as much activity as we can into the open badge format and try and catalyze the community. And obviously working with these global brands and leading colleges and universities um, we've been able to get a lot done in a short period of time. So let me start. This may be familiar turf for everyone in the room, or maybe there are still some people who believe that a badge is uh, an isolated thing, but the badge isn't the thing. The badge just represents the thing. And that's uh, an interesting point of departure. And I know when I talk to organizations that have, for instance, a lot of faculty members in them, that's often something we have to de debunk up front. Um, so I thought we would look first at what the emerging marketplace for open badges is, is looking like. Again, our view on this is that uh, badges should be uh, built with a purpose, not just built for fun. Uh, that it doesn't matter if you create a badge if it's not valuable enough for the earner to actually claim it and use it. So I'm going to talk for a second about some joint research we conducted with the University Professional and Continuing Education Association. Uh, I don't know how familiar that organization is to people in the room. Has anybody heard of UPSIA? So a few hands, right? It's a U.S.-based organization, although they aspire to connect up with, um, with their European counterparts, and I was talking with their executive director. So our, if there are those of you who are connected to adult education uh, in the EU, uh, come up to me. I'd love to connect you up with the UPSIA organization. It's basically 300 leading colleges and universities in the United States who are all focused around professional and continuing education, so meeting the needs of adult learners. And we wanted to know how seriously are you taking alternative credentials? And then related to that, are you looking at open badges as a way to represent those alternative credentials? So this is my key takeaway from that survey. It was a survey where we got about 215 out of the 300 or so to respond to us. And it, it's something of an eye chart, so I'll just read it for you for those of you in the back of the room. Basically, about two-thirds of the groups that were surveyed said that they see alternative credentialing as an important strategy for the future of their organization. That was a real concrete takeaway. So then we began to connect up, and this has really been the case we've been making in conjunction with UPSI, is sponsoring some webinars and education events around what is the significance of attaching a badge to that alternative credential that you're already issuing. And really, it boils down to these simple points. And those of you who have been working with open badge programs, this will be familiar for you as well. Um, there are a couple of nuances here that I should probably point out because it's also reflected in the decisions we've made around designing our platform for open badges. We only use hosted assertion badges. We don't do bake badges at all. And why is that? Well, the organizations that we work with are concerned with verifying the information behind the badge and verifying it in real time. So any place one of our badges is shared, and by the way, we're not unique in this way. There are a couple of other platforms that also only use hosted assertions. But this gives you the result that whenever you share it, you can click it, it phones home to the acclaim service, and it verifies itself. And secondly, and this has been particularly important for organizations like IBM, when those badges get clicked, we track the data. So David and his team have actionable data that can inform their strategies, right? Okay, I thought this was interesting. These are the types of programs that these uh, university continuing education groups 
uh, are looking at to produce alternative credentials. So on the high end are non-credit training courses and programs. That makes some sense. Non-credit certificate programs. And a certificate program is an obvious place to apply a badge, right? Graduate credit certificate programs, continuing education units. Way down at the bottom, the second to last there is micro-credentialing. And I think when badges were an early, a younger idea, micro-credentialing was a primary use case. We're going to really disrupt the way that education is organized. We're going to change the way things are happening. I think there are good, valid cases for micro-credentialing, but it's only one part of a larger strategy. Make sense? All right, now this was interesting too. So remember, two-thirds of the people surveyed said that it was strategically important to them to have an alternative credentialing program. And yet, only about one in five are already doing badges. So that represents the opportunity space among the adult and continuing education population. And I'm sure people from the Open University, you can probably verify this as well, with your work with other adult education organizations. There aren't enough of them yet that are doing badging. Um, and then for those of you who want a topical overview, what, how do they prioritize where they would produce alternative credentialing programs? And by inference, actually, where is it most relevant to badge? Business, education, teacher education, professional development is actually one of the more active areas these days. Technology and IT, and you heard a good use case there from David. Uh, professional and business services, healthcare, finance, real estate, and then so on down the list. And this actually parallels very closely the activity we're seeing across the badges in our platform. And I should say, we've issued more than 4.5 million badges. And we have north of 700,000 users. So we have a pretty good cross-section. Uh, and this is the last data you know, in terms of where you can get the full report. So if you want to see the full white paper that was uh, summarizing this, this survey that we did, you can, uh, you can go here. And Serge, I'll make this whole deck available to you so you can share it with people. Okay, so as a community, where are we with open badges? And this is one of the questions that came up early yesterday, right? Somebody asked, how many badges have been issued? How would we find that out across all of the open community? And somebody showed me, uh, uh, one of the, uh, Rob showed me yesterday, uh, some data he's mapped around uh, who's issued uh, with the attribution of openbadges.me, is that right, Rob? So that's another data source, but our best estimate is that 10 to, 10 to 20 million badges have been issued. We think there are millions of badge earners, but nobody can really tell you. Um, in post-secondary education, there's a, now I'd say a pretty general or wide awareness of badges. It fits into the alternative credential conversation, it fits into the unbundling conversation. Uh, in third-party credentialing, which is a space that we work in pretty actively, uh, I would say the awareness is at least as large, right? And as a, as a digital strategy for existing third-party credentials, badges are being rapidly adopted. Um, let's see, in terms of hiring practices and corporate training, I think they go hand in hand. And uh, this was a question I had for Bert, and you actually answered it at the end of your, at the end of your answer, Bert. Um, but it was, you're creating badges, do you accept badges, right? And I think this is a, an excellent question for all of us in the university setting, ask your admissions department, do they accept badges? If, they're, if they're, someone's trying to apply for a job, would they accept badges from an applicant? Or for Marilyn and the IBM HR team, do you accept badges, right? How can we try and foster a round tripping of this data? We all think it's great as a producer, but how do we feel about it as a consumer? So I think that's where the work is to do in the next year or so. Okay, and the last comment I would make about, uh, about general market awareness or about adoption of badges more generally or about making a business case, right? How do you get your boss to invest in your badge program? If you're not clear about what you're trying to measure going into it, what you're trying to produce, or you don't have the means to produce the data to support your argument, you're going to fail. So it's not only how many badges were issued, but how many of the badges that you issued were actually claimed. And if they were claimed, did the earners actually mark them public so others could see them? Are they discoverable? Were their badges shared? If so, how frequently were they shared and where were they shared? Were they shared to LinkedIn more frequently than Facebook? Shared to Twitter? Uh, it's interesting to us as we look at the data across our platform, 
For instance, we found that teachers and teacher education programs like to share to Facebook. Virtually everybody else likes to share to LinkedIn. I don't know what exactly is behind that, but that's an interesting topic. Dan, maybe you can get a research grant and study that. <clears throat> so, and, and then lastly, really, and these are the things that drive, again, that business equation. When these things get shared, what activity was generated? How many people clicked on that badge to verify it? How many people clicked into the deeper information associated with that badge? And how many leads did you generate or product downloads or whatever other kind of activity you're trying to drive from your badge program? In the case of these continuing get programs, it is directly translated into leads, right? Someone earns a continuing education certificate, another person in their professional circle sees it and says, I need to get something like that. Where did you get it? And they click on it and then they end up in Bernard's program asking about how can I go and become a teacher certified in technology for teaching, right? All right, and then lastly, and this is a general comment, but our focus is on employability. We try and connect learners to jobs and to further learning opportunities. And so that's really one of the things we measure ourselves on. Uh, I thought I would, you know, you've heard from Dan about competency-based education. That's one of the primary use cases in higher education. You heard from David about one big company sharing its, uh, its example and its data, and I really applaud IBM for being as open as they are. Um, Without corporate partners like IBM, the rest of the community will starve, right? They could, they've got an option. They could keep it all private and try and make a huge competitive advantage out of it. But I, I think it really benefits all of us that they're sharing their data as openly as they are. So I'm going to talk first about this uh, use case in solving skills gap. And I think this is the other primary uh, use case that's evolving in higher education. So it's basically using badges to normalize the language and decode the disconnect between higher education and employers. So the successful organizations, and I'll talk about two of them, are sitting down with their employer advisory groups and they're saying, we get the sense you're not satisfied with what we're producing. What skills do you need? What do you mean by that skill? If you, if you were to see that coming out of a college program, what would it look like? How would we assess it? What would you like to see? And it's sitting around a table and having a dialogue about these things and really, like I say, unpacking it together and trying to understand each other's perspective. And then, importantly, using the metadata structure of the open badge to put the answers in. Let's describe that skill or competency. Let's agree on what the criteria are that we used to measure it, right? And then lastly, given that you helped us create this, will you accept this when someone brings it to you? Not necessarily give them a job, but give them an interview, or give them a look, or at least give them credit for having done this, right? So I'm gonna talk about two of these community college examples, uh, but there are a number of them. Um, the first is an individual college, and the second is a system of colleges. And importantly, I think the system level solutions are really on the rise now. So I was really interested to hear William talk about uh, what goes on with the EU and the, and the passport program yesterday. Um, hey, Europass, is that what it's called? Um, as a sort of collective skills registry, that's a really interesting idea and I think it's being uh, paralleled and evidenced in some community college systems that we work with in the US. So. This is the page from the Santa Barbara Community College Career Skills Institute uh, what they've done here is they've taken a series of short courses, bundled them up into certificates. That part of it sounds familiar to any of you who work in continuing education. And then they credential the outcomes. And they've got a very active employer community that continues to advise it. Uh, so Career Skills Institute is a combination of courses and badges, and it's very clearly communicated in the website that they built to publicize it. So. They actually use the claims APIs to publish the catalog for this. So all of the badges first appear in a claim, but then they get duplicated out on their, their website. So the second example, and this is one that I think, again, indicates the direction that things are going and, and really picking up steam. Uh, in the California Community Colleges, which is a system of 113 colleges statewide, uh, 72 districts, 2.6 million students, um, they have a sort of a cultural tradition of being uh, fiercely independent of each other. Um, and within that, the faculty have a, a tradition of, uh, as they do in many organizations, of exerting a lot of control, right? 
So they had to try and find a way to produce a system of credentials or a system of uh, uh, workforce-related education programs that would be acceptable in that decentralized environment but still meet the needs of the employers across the state. So this is what they did. They began by uh, researching, um, so ICDM, so uh, Information and Computing Technologies and Digital Media, that's what that stands for, uh, is one of the industry sectors. There's a sector coordinator, a guy named Steve Wright, and Steve was the guy that drove this process. But Steve started by researching what are the entry-level market needs in our sector. And from there, so that involved a lot of conversations with employers. Um, probably first and foremost was Manpower Inc., the large uh, global uh, workforce outsourcing agency. And they talked with Manpower at, at some length. But then they also interviewed 400 small and medium-sized businesses across the state. And they said, if someone were to get an entry-level office job with you, what skills would you need? Um, they boiled that into a skill credential criteria. They, they stacked it up in a pathway. And then they invited the institutions to opt in. So notice we don't have any badges mentioned here at all yet, do we? It's about program design. And that's one of the lessons that Dan talked about. Right? The successful badge programs reflect a sound program design from the outset. They reflect some stakeholder engagement. They reflect sound instructional practice. Um, and frankly, in the case of this, they reflect the reality of the politics and the situation. They had to come up with a way to frame a common outcome without dictating what the pathway was to get to that outcome. So this is what they came up with, this idea of a branded pathway uh, it's unified around eight core competencies, and they define what the competencies are, and they actually lay out the competencies criteria, but they don't dictate to the colleges how you get to these competencies. And now what they've given them is a common way to market the same credential set out to the employers across the state, regardless of who the college is that provides it. So this is really what it boils down to, right? Uh, in order to tap into the 20,000 entry-level office jobs that are available at any given time in California, working through placement agencies or working directly to the employers, these are the, the eight core skills, right? It's a, a cluster of IT skills. There's some basic information systems, knowledge that you need. And then there are two programs, the last two, business communications and human relations customer service, that reflect the realities of working successfully in an office environment. And those are course related. But at the same time, they said, what are the alternative pathways? If you're already certified, if you already know something, what would we be able to accept as credit? So this is the way it's shaking out. And now you will see badges, right? So after we got all the way through the program design, now we're starting to look at how we make the outcomes represented in the form of digital, digital badges that can be verified. And the whole idea is there are multiple pathways. You could take eight different college courses, depending on the college. You could take four college courses that represent all eight of the skills, right? You could take a short course here and a short course there, earn a badge for each, and then combine them at a third place. Or you can go out and get a third-party industry certification from Microsoft or from Certiport and bring that in, and we'll give you partial credit towards the completion of the overall designation. So this is the kind of the, the potential that we see emerging. We are still struggling with how to brand this, right? Is this a California Community College branded badge? Is it a Certiport badge? Because Certiport does this kind of a program. Is it potentially a LinkedIn or a Microsoft badge? Are there other, and maybe it's a Manpower Inc. badge? We're not sure. But we do know from all the rest of the work that we do that the branding is going to be really important. So we're at that phase of determining how we make this into an effective badge program at this point. Okay, um, I'm going to move on now and talk a little about how you can look into some of these questions around um, badges in the wild, right? So if you're interested, and, and we do this all the time just for benchmarking and because we think it's fun, um, you can go to Twitter and search for badges that get shared on Twitter. To find the acclaim badges, search for that phrase, view my verified achievement or your acclaim. Um, Credly's got something similar. I don't remember exactly what the phrase is, but you can find one for Credly. And if you're using a badge issuing platform, ask them what their phrase might be or how, the, how you would search for their badges in, when they're shared on Twitter. Now, Twitter, from our experience, only represents about 10 to 15% of the overall shares. 
Um, so you're not going to get a fully representative view, but it's kind of fun because you see it in real time. So every time I log into Twitter, I see a different stream. This is the stream I downloaded this morning from the hotel. I was going to do this live in front of you, but we, we all kind of know what we're dealing with with Internet here. So. Um, so at the top, you've got a Microsoft exam. That's for their new certification program that launched on Friday. That'll be hundreds of thousands of badges, right? HR Certification Institute, here are some of the IBM badges. And actually, you can scroll down the page, and there are hundreds of badges, badges after badges after badges. So what can you do with this? Well, the first thing is take a look at all of the other great organizations like yours that are doing badging and feel good about that, right? The second is you can click into it, and as David said, you come to the acclaim landing page, you'll see that it's verified, but then click on one of the skill tags. So you would ask the question about how do we match up badges with the job market data. Every badge in a claim uses a skills keyword tag. So there's one or more skills associated with each badge. And we use that data to match up with the labor market data, in short. And we've got a you know, variety of other kind of secret sauce stuff that we're working on to try and optimize it. Um, so that we can take more of the inputs and match it up with more of the filtering kind of techniques. We can filter by level of job. We can filter by ONET classification. Uh, or yesterday we were talking with the team from uh, August and his team about, uh, uh, what's the name of your project again? ESCO. So, you know, potentially linking into that skills taxonomy. Um, I think this is a rich and exciting kind of new area. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool because the learners immediately see how relevant their learning is, right? And David covered this kind of data with you. This is this morning's data on, uh, on the, the skill big data. So in the U.S., we've got data for the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and uh, India, we just added. We prioritize com countries based on our user base. So those four countries are reflective of the top four countries where we get badges accepted and used. Um, one more word, when you use hosted assertions, you can do other cool stuff with badges. You can expire badges, you can update them, you can manage them, you can replace them, you can revoke them all in real time without having to have a blockchain assertion. You know, I think the, by the way, I think the blockchain stuff is really cool, but scaringly complex. Um, hopefully we'll sort that out in a couple of years from now, we'll have uh, a lot of evidence about how we're all using the blockchain to, to uh, also duplicate the ledger. Um, anyway, you can recommend next steps and you can provide a lot more context and pathways that way. You can connect up your badges. So, I'm in the home stretch now. Everybody holding in there? Good. Uh, a few comments about more successful programs versus less successful programs. Um, the ecosystem you're contemplating is very important at the outset. Uh, we find people trust badges from organizations they've already heard of. Might seem obvious, right? But the brand matters. So if you're a young organization or an informal learning provider, you need to focus on building your brand before you worry about your badge program, right? Um, think about how to make connections with other stakeholders you interact with. For some of the local colleges we work with, it's the local business or chamber of commerce. For the more regional focused colleges and universities, they focus on sort of nationwide employers. And some of the global partners that we work with have a very global perspective and they want to interact with all of the above. Um, anyway, and it's also worth thinking about how the badges you're issuing form a progression. How do they become a funnel towards a professional goal, right? It may not all come from you, but you should have relationships with anybody else down the chain towards a further progression or with any feeder organization. So we work with the GED organization in the US, which is the high school equivalency uh, diploma. And a lot of the issuing bodies that we work with are now interested in tapping into the GED students as a potential student, right? Uh, IBM may want to attract those students with good math and science proficiency into an IT career or Microsoft, right? Um, others may want to try and attract that same audience into a healthcare career. Um, you know, maybe you've got a curriculum in one area or another and those are interesting to you. So anyway, think about the up chain and the down chain uh, of who else you interact with. And then lastly, and I really do promise we'll come to the final ideas here. Um, these are our three simple rules, right? 
the brand matters. You have to have some rigor behind it. Although you can define what level of rigor you want, and I think David's point about having entry-level pathways is really valid. Right? And lastly, the badges that are most valuable are the ones that represent in-demand skills. And I have an actual um, kind of a, a codicil that I'll add to that. The most valuable badges are also the most rigorous badges. So if it was really hard to earn, those are the ones we see claimed the most frequently and shared the most frequently. You know, the Cisco CCIE, it takes about five years to get one of those. Those badges get claimed and shared at rates like nothing else. So long story short, badges should have resume potential and avoid the good smiler badge. <laughs> right? John, was it you that was talking about the good smilers this morning, about putting a blockchain recognition on? Blockchain recognition is fine, but don't issue them a badge. Okay. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, this is sort of the summary value statement around, you know, what I talk to issuing organizations about. It's about you know, expanding your program brand and reach, using new forms of interaction, uh, generating data from your badge program. And again, if you're not, if you're not measuring those outcomes, you're not going to get where you want to go. And then lastly, and really IBM is, is leading in this area too, um, they're creating badges that they're allowing their partners to use. So if you're a university partner of IBM, soon you'll be able to issue an IBM badge. So your learners will get not only a university credential, but an IBM credential. That's a win for you because your learners get a real industry credential. It's a win for IBM because they get data visibility down to that level of granular outcome like David was talking about. All right, thank you. Questions? Any questions for Pete? Thank you very much, very interesting presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, a small thing, you showed the slide with the uh, sectors that are uh, where, where batches are uh, coming up. And totally at the bottom I saw the military, and I was a bit surprised because yeah, you, have, you have the batch for vets uh, uh, thing was, what, what was uh, initiated. And also I see it as a, as a use case to, to link the military career and the military job skills to what you need in a, in a private market. So is there any explanation that you see? Or? Um, those of you who work in government will recognize this. It's a very long development cycle. Right, so while they may see the value of it, it could take us years to get it actuated. We have to get funding for it, et cetera. Um, that Badges for Vets program was an interesting program, but it never scaled. Um, the, in the U.S., there's an organization, ACE, uh, which is an education department chartered organization that evaluates credit for prior learning. Uh, part of ACE does something called a military transcript where they translate your military training into things that should give you course credit, right? I think that's an obvious place for badges. Um, there are some business model obstacles getting past that, right? And we see this, as we find more ways to credential, we see there is often a business model hurdle to, to, to these, these new disruptive models. So if someone is charging a fee for a transcript right now, you have to find a way to replace that income for them, otherwise they won't give away a free badge. Right. Any other questions? Uh, thank you to all the speakers. This has just all been really, really fascinating. I'm wondering what's being said to the recipients, and it's open to, the, to the, all the panelists. What's being said to the recipients of the open badges? Say there could be people with any type of skill level. The open badge could reflect any type of skill but just the piece about what happens next with the open badge, with sharing the badge, with uh, displaying it, managing it, in terms of the elements of their identity that are within it. Um, is, there a, is there much consideration of this, of just um, giving them advice on how to use the badge? 2.0. I, I know. In the new standards. <laughs> I know uh, David and his team have actually given a lot of thought about communicating with badge earners. Yeah, it's a really good point because to get people to claim the badge, you better tell them why they should care. And we have messaging out there, and we can even share that with you as well, that we use that show 
what the benefits are, what you should be doing with it, what you should be doing next. Like Pete said, some of this is built into a claim that says here are the next steps you should take. But you're absolutely right. And you have to, when you, after you issue the badge, you have to mark it to people to get them to claim the badges and tell them why they should care, especially at this stage of the diffusion of this innovation. Right. You know, I mean, the claim rates, and I think Pete can tell you a little bit about the claim rates on that, but they're starting to hockey stick up. People are starting to automatically see the value. When we started the program, though, we had to convince people to claim the badge and tell them, you know, how to use it. Right. I, I would just add to that that the, one of the primary distinctions between a successful badge program measured by those metrics and one that's less successful is uh, the ability of the issuing organization to put marketing landing pages on their site that will answer these questions for their earners. And, um, and then we spend a lot of time, we have a marketing kit and we give a lot of examples like the IBM marketing or the Microsoft marketing or whatever to our clients as they come on board to help them explain these same issues to their users, right? Can I, can I go through? So to just elaborate, so Carrie, and Nate, and others are working on the, the 2.0 standards and, and in, in key ways it seems like linked data, which is still just magic to me, I don't understand it at all, but I do understand that the distinction between claiming starts to go away when your badges, when you're broadcasting that information out over the web using linked data. Um, one question I have for, can I ask one more? So, so one of the issues that I face, I know, with my own badges that I issued for my open courses uh, in sharing was the way that uh, LinkedIn would mangle them. Uh, Facebook does a much better job. Uh, you know, the big appeal is it's really hard to build a social network, even a learning recognition network. And so there's, it seems like a, a, we're, we're getting somewhere. I wonder, for instance, with, with the, the pivot at, at LinkedIn, whether you think that the, the problems of, like, your badges, do they display? Uh, a, no a, one's badge images display on LinkedIn. The LinkedIn API only allows you to put the description of the badge in the permanent certifications part of the profile. So many of us in the room would want to put our badges in courses or in education, not in certifications, right? Well, you can't do that. Many of us would like to have our badge images displayed next to the badge. You can't do that either. LinkedIn has the image of the organization, so it'll be your university logo or your company logo yeah. next to the achievement. If you click on that, it takes you to the company page inside LinkedIn, right? So it doesn't take you to the evidence. This entire, <laughs> if you click on the link, it takes you to the evidence. Or in the case of a claim, it dials you home to that claim service. It shows you the verified badge, and then you got all the full mm -hmm. metadata, right? Um, this is one of the challenges in working with LinkedIn. We think we'll make some progress with it over the next little while, uh, particularly given that Microsoft is big time behind open badges, and now they're buying LinkedIn. So keep your fingers crossed. Uh, what we want to have them do there, and this is our perspective generally, we're not doing this for competitive advantage for a claim. We're doing this so that it's open to open badges. And that's my comment about e-portfolios, right? I think e-portfolio vendors should focus less on integrations with specific badge providers and focus more on full support of the open badge yeah. spec. So I can just publish open badges over to Pathbright or Portfolium or whoever. We're going to take one, uh, okay, two more questions. Uh, I saw Carrie first, so. Hey, I'll be super quick, and um, it's actually more of a, a, an opinion than, um, than a question. Uh, IBM, you, know, you, you guys did a really great job with IBM and the claim badges, and I do think it's going to do a lot for employ, employment opportunities. But I just want to say that the Happy Smiler badge it's okay. Like, I think that badges are not all about hiring and employment. Like, we do not live to work. Yeah, no, and so my, pers my perspective is, is simply framed on the data around claim rates, right? Okay. If you look at the claim rate on a good Smiler badge or the claim rate on a big data badge from IBM, you're going to see the IBM badge far outpaces the good Smiler badge because the earners don't find it per permanently valuable. We don't know that yet. But right? can I, can I comment on that we one We have pretty as well? good data that says that's the case. Can, but I want to comment on that too, because when we first started this out, one of the things that we liked about a claim was the, you know, the fact that our mostly professional badges, we didn't really want our badges commingled with beer badges and be the only company, you know, IBM plus, you know, X number of beer companies, right? But position, back to your point though, there's a, there's a, a very important uh, distinction to what you're saying, maybe a nuance to what you're saying. Um, I've been working with a couple um, groups that work with the U.S. Department of Education. 
and they're working with these underprivileged youths in small in cities, right? And I think LRNG probably has the same perspective. And we don't want to lose some of that interest level activity. For example, if somebody's interested in music, or they're interested in fishing, or they're interested in something else, and they happen to earn maybe the beer badge, right, or that fishing badge, imagine the possibilities of being able to connect what they truly love to do in life with these skills that they're getting from these professional things. I can take somebody who has a fishing badge, combine it with somebody who has a Watson Analytics badge, and I can place them in outdoor world, right? So think about that, or the beer one, they could be working for Anheuser-Busch or for a, a major manufacturer too. So I, I think that, that the point though, that we, we absolutely have to start to think about how do we combine interests and um, cultural fit with these skills. Let me just add, if you wanted that person who's doing analytics in the outdoor world in a public facing environment who knows how to smile, in other words, it's, it's about the claim, right? If the claim is, is can, can you know, present point. themselves professionally and, and appropriately, it's all about the claim. So, so there may be some yeah. situations where a smile badge, where you are looking for someone with evidence to support the claims that they are a pleasant person. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Peter, and the, and the panel. It's a very, very good panel. Um, one of the issues that struck me is when, you, when the conversation was talking about the cycle time it takes to actually develop badges and their, their, their proliferation is um, the filtering and you were talking about discoverability but the, and the question I was asking is about discoverability is you can discover a, a thousand or ten thousand badges around a particular set of topics or something but what you really wanted to discover the 15 or 20 that actually matches something that you care about what kind of work are you thinking about doing in terms of dealing with this essentially cascade of, of exponential badge uh, yeah. possibilities. So um, I, I found working with this community that we tend to worry more about what will happen in the future than maybe we should, right? So uh, and maybe this is just the nature of all of us looking ahead with enthusiasm for what we see the, the future will hold. But um, I, I think the first step to, to walk before we run is to get enough organizations issuing badges and recognizing badges that we form a critical mass and that we become a new data source to inform